Welcome to Bloomerang Academy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it is a sunny 73 degrees in Indianapolis right now. We, we got some cold weather yesterday and the day started off at like 59, but we're at 73 right now. Um, still pretty nice and nice heading into fall. We haven't officially started yet, but we wanted to go through just some of our intro slides to make sure that everything's working. You can join the online audio or you can dial in. The number is 669-900-6833. This is a great number to have in hand in case you have any internet connectivity issues or you need an interpreter to dial in for you. You can give them this number and not miss out on any of the great content that we have for you today. While we have this up, um, if you could let us know if you can see the screen and you can hear me, um, please click on that raise hand button from your end. Lovely. Thank you so much, Barb, Wendy, and everyone else who is already here with us today. We also have Q&A open for today. We'll have Q&A um, throughout and at the end of the presentation. But if we don't get to all of your questions, not to worry, we'll make sure to send a follow-up via email. My name is Diana. You may have um, met me for, through other Academy classes before. We have our friends from QGIF today, Justin and Brendan. You'll meet them more here in a little bit. They'll also be helping, uh, Brandon, Brendan will also be helping with Q&A on the back end. So if you have any questions, you don't have to wait for the Q&A portion. Just go ahead and type that in. Um, and so we can make sure that we get all of your questions or as much of your questions answered. Our chat is also open today. I love using chat because you can have that to set to go to the presenters or just or with everyone. If there's questions, insights, experiences you would like to share with each other, you can share that in the chat. Also, if you'd like to let us know where you're dialing in from and what the weather like is in your area, please let us know in the chat. We always love seeing the weather report from all over. So don't be shy and say hello. We also have live transcript available. So if this is something that you would like or you need, you can toggle that on and off from your end um, using the live trans transcript um, button. Also, as a reminder that this class is being recorded, so after today's class, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording and the slides. So not to worry, um, you'll get a copy of the slides. Um, resources will be linked in there as well, um, so you won't miss out on anything. And we're right at about time. Thank you again for joining us at Blue Ring Academy, where today we are talking about tools and strategies for hybrid fundraising events. I'm super excited about this topic and here to talk to us about it is Justin Cook. Hi, Justin. Hi, how's it going? Thank you everyone for joining us today. It's, this is another great and exciting topic. I love talking about hybrid fundraising events and why your nonprofit should host it. So before we get started here, I do wanna talk a little bit about QGIVE. Anyone that is unfamiliar with us, we are an online fundraising platform. We have solutions for all size nonprofits, including year round fundraising tools, text giving, peer to peer fundraising, and auction tools. You are at the center of everything that we do here at QGIVE, and our goal is to make your fundraising as easy as possible so you can raise more money online. And if you're interested in learning more about what we do or what we offer, please visit us at www.qgive.com. As Diana mentioned, my name is Justin Cook. I'm the product marketing manager here at QGIVE. And I do apologize, I'm getting over a cold. So that last little pesky bit is the cough and all of that little nasally. So do apologize for that. If you do hear any coughing, I'll try my best uh, not to bother anyone with that. Um, but I have been the product marketing manager here at QGIVE. Um, I've been here about four years now and a marketing professional for seven. So really in depth. Um, with all of the digital marketing that we do here at QGIVE. And one of my passions is optimizing the, uh, the user journey that we have. That is to say that I try to make it as easy as possible for you to learn more about QGIVE online through our website. And I have three animals. I am at home, so if you do hear them, um, I do apologize for that as well, but I have one dog and two cats and they're all little lovebirds. 
<clears throat> so what are we talking about today? Um, the first thing is why nonprofit um, hybrid events and why you should try them. So one of the first things, and you know, this is the obvious one, it's the elephant in the room, COVID, right? COVID is still around and our donors may still be hesitant to attend those in-person events. So hybrid fundraising events allow your organization to host both the in-portion part and the virtual part, which makes it more comfortable for your donors that are really hesitant about the in-person piece and attending virtually from home is something that is a safer option for them. Number two, a virtual component to your fundraising event extends the reach of your fundraiser. So, for example, if you're hosting something here in Lakeland, Florida, right, we only have a limited range in which our donors could attend our Lakeland event, correct? And what the virtual component does is that actually expands our reach into the entire U.S., we can actually offer a virtual component to everyone and uh, every one of our donors that live in the United States to participate in our event. So it is something that will can increase the amount that you raise and the bidders as well as the registrations that come in for any of your events. And finally, we've seen over the pandemic that donors are willing to participate in the virtual components of these, whether it's a virtual only component that we had to do when there was the, the lockdown with the pandemic. And after the fact, when we started going back into the hybrid events, some of the don some donors prefer this as a route. So it is something that your organization should definitely look into, and it offers a great experience to all of your donors. So what are we going to be looking at today? You're, we're going to look at how your organization can successfully raise money with hybrid events. With each example that we have, we'll have a takeaway you can apply to your own events and a tip for how to use QGIVS tools to keep your supporters engaged and excited about your event. And we're going to take a look at one standard fundraising event. So what do I mean by standard? I mean the, the events that don't have some of these additional pieces to it, like peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. We have a component where we're encouraging our donors to raise money on behalf of our organization, right? And then with silent auction tools, that we're asking them to also participate in the auction, right? So they're bidding, um, they're donating through a fund of need. Standard fundraising events don't have any of this. This is simply the uh, the on-site or the virtual component that doesn't have any of the fundraising or the bidder components. Then we're also going to look at peer-to-peer -peer fundraising events, which is that uh, event that encourages our donors to start raising money on behalf of our organization and silent auction events. So, you know, the bidding, the ones that bring in the big bucks, right? But first, let's look at a couple of best practices for um, our hybrid fundraising events and how we can encourage donors to participate in either the in-person or the virtual component. So it's, it's not really a secret, but this is communicating clearly with your donors is of utmost importance of importance for your fundraisers. But effective communication is critical for these event communications with hybrid events and they should be really clear about one why supporters should participate uh, in fundraising how does it work um, how can they start getting involved um, and how they're going to make a greater impact um, and you can use that you can use some impactful images and videos um, but you do want to make sure that you're uh, showing fun your fundraisers how they can get involved with the event you should also tell them why they should participate um, in, in the fundraiser itself, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, Ugh, the, the cough there. Um, make sure that you're showing donors the exact reasons why they need to, why they should be attending your fundraiser, whether it is in person or it's hybrid. Um, you can also ask them what's expected as a fundraiser and you need to really show them where they can sign up, right? Um, so give them a clear call to action, tell them how they sign up um, for your hybrid fundraising event um, and show them what the next steps about that. Ooh. So next, what you're gonna do is you're going to inspire your supporters. Um, so the what you wanna, 
these slides, sorry, excuse me. I'm gonna skip this slide because I think um, I have a couple of rogue slides in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip on to the ideas for our standard hybrid fundraising events. I apologize for that. So like I said, these are standard events that do not include a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising or an auction component. So one of the first things that you can do for a hybrid standard fundraising event is host a dinner and a movie, right? So these are really easy to put on. So you can have an, the in-person part where you find maybe a section on a lawn or you find like a, um, a, a mess hall or something to actually host that event in person. But this is also something that is really, really easy to translate online as well. So you can live stream it through YouTube video or Facebook, uh, Facebook Live. Uh, any any types of those platforms, you can do it through Zoom as well. But hosting a, a dinner and a movie is something really easy uh, for your organization to put on. And for the dinner side of it, basically what you can do is offer some DoorDash, um, DoorDash gift cards. You can offer them to select a specific meal uh, through some service like... Um, like the, uh, I can't remember what the name is, but basically they have pre prep meals that they can select and then you can actually ship it to them. And you can also provide options for snacks and other type maybe drinks as well. So all of that for the virtual component is great for your organization to use that they can order right from right from your registration form. And the in-person side, you can just ask them on your registration form how what they would like for dinner on site. So if you're doing maybe a spaghetti dinner, uh, if you're doing a steak dinner or something like that, ask them exactly what they're interested in so that you can prep that um, online uh, when they get to the to the event. And this translates well, not only as a movie, but you can do this as a concert as well. So any type of musical act, you can do that as well. Uh, next, you can do some type of activity. So one of the things that we saw a lot during the pandemic was that we're stuck at home, right? So a, an activity for kids to do at home or on site, uh, something like a scavenger hunt, a costume contest, uh, crafting parties, or even chores for charity. That, that was a fun one that we saw. Anything to get uh, kids or even adults. I mean, adults love scavenger hunts too. Uh, any one of those to get your donors involved um, and you know, fundraising uh, and donating to your organization. Uh, trivia in game nights. So we see this a lot, a uh, lot more often as we've seen the hybrid event model and the virtual only components come where organizations are taking that typical trivia night where someone goes and you, you participate in the, you know, it could be at a bar, it could be at a restaurant, you know, those typical trivia nights that we have and game nights as well. There are a couple of different game platforms where you can get a bunch of people on uh, to work and play at the same time, right? And you can do this both in person and virtually as well. The trivia component, um, you can do the in person wherever you would like. And then the virtual, you can host it through Zoom and everything that we talked about here previously. And the same thing with the game nights as well. Next, you can do a talent, an art show or a fashion show. So we see a lot of these as well, and it works pretty much the same way as you would with streaming a concert or streaming a video, right? So the in-person, you would set up your audience and then you would just live stream exactly what all of your participants are doing at your event. You can also do some type of sale. So a swap shop, a craft fair, a plant sale, a farmer's market book sale. You, you can set up these shops on site and have uh, your donors participate and buy all of the uh, things that they would like uh, on site, or you could set up a virtual uh, shop as well uh, along, alongside that so that they can shop from wherever they would like. And finally, you can sell services like a car wash, pet grooming, lemonade stands. Uh, you can sell tickets for some type of service that they can redeem in person, or as we mentioned before, you can also use those different types of gift cards and have it shipped to them so that they can, uh, so that they can uh, redeem those uh, some way. And, but that, well, all this does is generate interest in your nonprofit and it gets your donors engaged. So a couple of examples that we've, that we've seen over the last couple of years. The first one is Disney Bingo. And it sounds just like that. It was a really exciting uh, bingo course and it was all Disney themed and they were able to host this both virtually and online. So uh, I'm sorry, virtually and in person. So it was a really great event. The kids absolutely loved it. 
Um, next, we have Whiskers and Wine Online Telethon. So essentially what they did is they hosted an online telethon and uh, it was for the benefit of dogs. And uh, I guess you can guess what the, the prize was. It was for wine, right? So really exciting thing that they did. Um, and then we also have the Backyard Burlesque where they made homemade cocktails. Uh, from a couple of bartenders, and then they also hosted an online raffle with that. So really great and creative ideas on how your organization can use different types of these standard fundraising events to translate them into what we call the hybrid event and offer that in-person and virtual component. So some fundraising best practices uh, that you should take when you are doing these standard hybrid events. And one, like I said before, communication is critical. Making sure that you are communicating with your donors, telling them how they can participate in person, but also online as well. And you know what we take the same best practices that we would with an in-person with virtual. So in person, we wanna make sure that they understand where the location is, how they can, where parking is, how they get into the venue, um, if we have table seating set up, where are they going to sit, et cetera, et cetera, right? But on the virtual side, it's just as important to make sure that you're doing some of their things. Where can they go to participate in the online version of the event? How do they get signed in? Is there anything that they need to know about how their computer um, needs to log into all of this? Is there a certain app that they need to download, make sure that you're communicating effectively with your donors so that they understand exactly where they need to go. Two, update your automated receipts. It is a valuable place to add participation details and other important information. So not only are we communicating on the front end with our emails and putting it on our landing pages, but we're also sending out automated receipts and we're editing that content so that our donors know exactly where they need to go. And it's always great to say thank you for participating as many times as you can. Um, and an automated receipt is a perfect place to add that. And finally, you can boost event participation by intentionally recruiting people to spread the word about your event, especially on social media. So we call these brand ambassadors. And basically the idea around this is you're looking for individuals that are really gung-ho about your nonprofit. They have some type of personal connection with your mission and you often see them either donating or they are engaging with your nonprofit through social media and other various avenues that um, that they can participate they can engage with your nonprofit. So what you want to do is you want to reach out to them and you're going to say, hey, thank you for if they've signed up for the event, thank you for signing up for the event, but also recognize all of their past engagement that they have. And just ask them to say if they can share your event, share it with their networks, share it with their friends and family, right? This is a great way to boost event participation um, and get the word out about your event. And you can do all of this with QGIVS tools. So it, within QGIV itself, you can build packages and uh, you can even set up private packages. So if you have a specific VIP or a sponsorship that you wanna hide just for one particular person, you can do that as well. And you can even add promo codes using our event registration uh, platform. It's available to all QGIV users. It is, there is no cost to use it um, and it's in our base package. So lots of power specifically in our events tools. You can use conditional content to include specifics about your participants' front registration details and receipts. So conditional content is the ability to add content based on a certain condition, right? So let's say they are asking, you ask them if they want a specific meal, if they're going in person. Using conditional content, you can actually put that content in their receipt to make sure that they know which option they choose. And then vice versa, on the virtual side, if you ask a virtual attendee what type of meal they want, you can still use that conditional content, but it'll be a different one because there is a different pattern that we have to follow there, right? We have to actually send them something rather than they're going to come pick it up. So conditional content is a great way to make sure that you're changing out and communicating in a personalized way with your donors. And finally, our reports and customizable dashboards will help you see a list of all the registrants you have and track your overall fundraising progress. So not only will you be able to do this with just the uh, the standard events that you have that you host this year, but then you'll have all of those performance metrics 
as you continue to use it year over year as well. So you can compare to see how you're doing. So let's move on to hybrid peer-to-peer -peer events. Now, peer-to-peer -peer events, these are the extra component where we are encouraging our donors to fundraise on behalf of our organization. And we have a couple of really great ideas. So network fundraisers. Basically, the idea of network fundraisers is you are engaging someone in your community that is has a wide network of people that they know. And you're asking them to be an advocate on behalf of your organization. Go out, talk to different people in the community that is in, in their networks, and encourage those people to donate to your organization. Now, network fundraisers, we tend to look at board members. We look to we typically look at local celebrities and other types of uh, individuals that have those wide networks. And you can do many, many different things with network fundraisers. We've seen organizations do a uh, basically a dance with the stars sort of theme in St. Louis where they recruited local celebrities to participate in that. And then basically the donors would donate to the organization to say who they thought was the best dancer uh, after training for about six or eight weeks. We've seen this with breast cancer awareness, with breast cancer awareness, with other types of cancer awareness, where uh, all month long, an advocate would wear a certain color, and then they would go out and promote the nonprofit. And the one who raises the most money is the, the winner, essentially, at the end of the, the fundraiser. So lots of power here. Network fundraisers are really great for your organization to really expand the reach and tap into some of those networks that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise. Then we have the more traditional things that you can do, walks, runs, bike rides, or any other fun activity. And we've seen in the pandemic where we started to see a lot of these come back in a virtual only because there are a ton of different activity apps that can track the the donors movement and all of the things that we want them to do for these walks and runs and bike rides. But these are obviously great ideas too for in-person events as well. So these are perfect for hybrid fundraising events where they, you have the traditional walk or run and they can do it from home or they can come and they can visit and they can participate on site. Contests or challenges. So this is one of my favorite ones as well, where you can, we had one during the pandemic about individuals that were raising money um, in the Everest challenge. So it was encourages everyone to step up 20, do some to some activity 29 times, whether that was jump rope 29 times, whether that was walk up your stairs 29 times, whether that was to run a lap 29 times. They we had a contest or a challenge throughout. You you one might ring a bell for the ice bucket challenge too. So contests and challenges are really great, not only in a virtual component, but in an in-person as well. DIY fundraising. So do-it-yourself fundraising basically encourages your donors to donate the proceeds they would get from a certain event in their life. One of those being a birthday, one of those being a wedding or a big milestone, a memorial, graduation. There's a lot of different ways that DIY can work and you can encourage your participants to do this all virtually and raise money in, for your organization instead of them, you know, taking money for their birthday or what have you. And then you can also do table-based events like galas and luncheons. Um, and with a new great table seating component that is from QGive, I will show you some of the great things and why table-based is really fun to do. So some real examples that we have here of hybrid peer-to-peer -peer fundraising events. Uh, Fido and Friends, uh, Fun Walk and Run, Run and Walk, they did this both in person and virtually. Um, so it was it was one of those, again, where you see that participants could join in the fund from anywhere and everyone could win prizes. So they had actually two separate pools of prizes, one for in-person and one for virtual. Uh, so that was really cool to see where they're offering, offering different types of prizes based on how you're participating. Next, we have our team resilience here, Race for Depression Awareness with Erica's Lighthouse. Their challenge uh, was to participate in a marathon uh, during World Mental Health Day. Uh, but essentially, instead of doing it in the traditional fashion where you get all of the 26 miles done in under, what, five or six hours, uh, everyone could participate 1.1 mile every hour, and they could choose to race however made them happy. They could walk, they could cycle, they could swim, or they could kayak. So it really spread out the, the marathon to make it a lot easier on, 
uh, participants to participate in this type of event. And then we had our uh, dance-a-thon here. Um, this was a one that I really love. It was purely virtual, but is a great example of an event that could be both hybrid with the right setup. So essentially the idea was to get kids up and participate and uh, essentially what they did is they worked with uh, like dance coaches and in a virtual environment, they had the, the dance club and they were pre-recorded and then they had a live component as well where they just did different dances and they encourages, encouraged the kids to participate and get up and move around. This is one that you can really do both virtually and in person as well. As you can see, if you have that live component, then the kids are right there with you and you can live stream that for, kid, for the kids to dance as well. One of the, so some best practices to encourage your uh, individuals that are fundraising for your organization, one of these is to have some type of single fundraising dashboard for them to log into and access all of the resources that your organization can give to them. You know, our fundraisers, our donors are not typical fundraisers, and when they do start fundraising for our organization, they're typically big hurdles that we have to get over because they're just not used to it. They're afraid to ask for money. So something that we like to encourage is for our nonprofits to upload a fundraising guide, upload social templates, email templates, text templates, storytelling resources, anything that will help your um, donors to get into that fundraising habit and make it easy for them. They don't have a lot of time to sit down and write emails or social media copy. So providing them with those templates will make it a lot easier for them to get started. And since, like I said, they're not seasoned fundraisers, they'll get over that hump a little bit quicker and start fundraising for your organization. Next, have supporters create and customize their own personal and team fundraising pages. So there's a lot of research that's gone into this that uh, when your supporters do create and customize their own fundraising page, they tend to raise a lot more money. And the reason is, is because they can tell their personal story. They can tell what, what it is they're raising money for and why. And that's important not only for your organization, but for the supporters that are starting to raise money for your, uh, for your organization. So give them the platform to work on their, to work and fundraise and tell their story to their networks. And finally, have something that is like a welcome quest. So this will help supporters get familiar with their fundraising dashboard, and it'll check off some of the uh, the four key behaviors that we're talking about here. Uh, the first one is personalizing their, fun their, their fundraising page and sending a fundraising email and sharing on social media. Three of the big things that we always tell our nonprofits to encourage because once they start fundraising and getting momentum going, then that will help your donors get to get kicked off and actually raise money for your organization, keep them engaged um, and fundraising. So what, how can you do this in QGive? So uh, we have a lot of communication tools that are in QGive specifically for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. And it's not just for you, it's also for your donors. That is one of the things that I love about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is that not only do your organization have access to these communication tools, your donors will as well when they are deciding to fundraise. So they will have access to social media, email, and text fundraising tools so that they can reach out to their networks. You can, they can use personalization tokens and email lists, uh, which help not only you, but your supporters to personalize communications and reach out to networks. And then finally, supporters can integrate with Facebook fundraisers to raise funds directly from their Facebook page. And this is an amazing thing as you are fundraising and you're raising money um, through Facebook itself, they never have to leave Facebook. And all of that information is then sent back into QGive so that you can capture that information. Another great part of QGIVS platform is the gamification tools. So gamification is the act of making a activity into a little bit of a game, right? And the science behind this is that everyone likes to be rewarded. So we reward our supporters the more that they fundraise, the more that they reach certain milestones, we reward them for that. And that keeps them engaged in raising money. Um, so in QGIVS itself, you can create custom badges or use our default badge system. So badges are one of the easiest ways to encourage and reward our donors as they are fundraising. 
we have dedicated team and individual leaderboards that can be integrated on any page. So leaderboards show off who's raising the most money. So if you really want to get that competition kicked up and get your teams and your individuals raising more money, leaderboards are the way to go. And finally, you can create and customize fundraising thermometers to show off your fundraising progress. We always say the closer that you're getting to your thermometer, the more your donors really want to donate. They want to see you hit that goal. Um, so make sure that you're setting up thermometers to track the progress of your fundraising and encourage your donors uh, to, to finish that, uh, your goal, right? So let's look at ideas for hybrid silent auction events. So silent auction hybrid events, these are really great for your organization. And one of the things that I wanna really focus on on this side of things is you have a ton of ideas, but hosting a really effective hybrid auction event is really in the details and the things that you offer. So the first thing, if you're gonna provide entertainment that you wanna make sure that it can be viewed at the site itself and live streamed. Like I mentioned earlier, you can do YouTube Live, you can do Zoom, there's, there's many different ways that you can live stream your event. But it's very important that you, if you are offering both components, that you have a way for your donors to continue to interact with your, your event, both in person and virtually. Next, you want to show donors how they can participate in person and virtually. So when you are raise, doing an auction, you tend to have the bidding component to it. So if they're in person and you have some type of bid sheet that you're doing or you're using fundraising software uh, like QGive, you would have a web-based and an app-based bidding uh, for your, your donors. So it's important to show them how they're going to participate both in person and virtual, depending on which option they choose. Make sure that they know because if they can't bid virtually, then you should let them know that, hey, you know, we, you know, in person you can bid, but you can't. That's one of the great things about fundraising software is that donors can participate from everywhere, whether they're in person or virtual. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the great things that I love about QGive. Make sure that you highlight your big ticket items or any unique packages on your social media and on with a video on your auction page. So we're talking about big ticket. We're talking, you know, there's an experience in Greece and we really want to sell this and get our bidders interested in working, you know, get, bidding on this item to win it, right? So a video is a great way to show off the experience that they can win and making sure that you post on social media, that you highlight it during your live stream, um, that you, anywhere that you can, make sure that you're communicating your big ticket items so that you can, can encourage bidders to continue bidding on it. And finally, including a contest, a contest like a raffle is always a great way to bring in a little bit extra money um, to your organization and it gives your, uh, your donors a way to win something cool, right? If they don't want to bid, then offer the contest to you know, encourage them to still engage with the event. And you can do this both online and in person. So one of a virtual auction that we saw, um, this one was really, really cool, the Festival of Trees. So the Festival of Trees was, mm, excuse me, there is one of them. Um, the, virtual, the, the Virtual Trees was the an auction that they hosted. And essentially what donors did is they signed up for the auction. And then they could schedule a time to go see the great trees that they had in person. Um, so that was a really great way to bring in the virtual component of the hybrid auction into a more in-person type of thing. Now they didn't have to do the in-person and they could see all of the trees virtually, but come on, you wanna go smell and touch all of those great trees, right? Uh, and then we have moonbeams, beams and big dreams. So. They had high uh, entertainment, both in person and live stream. And again, because it is a hybrid auction, it was all of their bidding was able to be participated in from anywhere. That so, QGive tools and tips. So, again, first one: communicate, ensure supporters know where to register, how to view and bid on items, and so on. Uh, specifically with QGive, we both have an app based, so they can download an app on their phone and participate in the auction itself. And we have a web base, so they don't have to download the app. They can go into one of their their favorite browser that they have and participate in the auction that way. 
So make sure that you communicate and they know not only how to register, but then how they can bid on items and access both versions of um, that, the event that you're, you're hosting. Make sure to establish a point person to handle questions and help supporters participate. So this is both for an in-person and a virtual. So uh, in person, you want to make sure it's someone that knows the technology, but is really good with uh, it's going to be on site. And then you want to have a separate person for the virtual component, someone that really knows the live stream and is able to handle any technical questions about the bidding um, that you have going on. Uh, and again, make sure you uh, highlight your big ticket items, but it, you can also highlight your fund to need items as well. You know, anything that you want your participants to donate to your organization, make sure that you highlight those as well. And you can show your fundraising progress throughout the event to encourage more participation and don uh, donations. So that can be through a thermometer. That could be just by pulling up the amount that you've raised onto the live stream. Just make sure that you're highlighting that. And so you can encourage people to continue to donate and participate. Some more tips that we have, make sure to start early. Uh, you need at least 30 days before your auction, especially if you need training from anyone here at QGIV. Uh, and that's being generous. I think 30 days is a very short time frame to not only find and secure auction items, but then to set up your event start communicating and make sure that everyone understands how they can participate. So uh, it's a generous, but you can pull it off. Um, uh, but I would suggest at least 30 days. Make sure in QGIV that you have your supporters enable our push notifications so that they know when they're outbid on auction items. So this is a fantastic feature of our app where when someone is bidding on an item, they can get a notification directly in their phone that tells them that they've been outbid on an item. Then if they click on that notification, it'll take them right back to the item that they're outbid on, and then they can continue to bid. So a really great option for uh, your organization to encourage bidding and continue to get them to bid um, and participate in your auction. If you have a lot of items, make sure that you add tags so supporters can easily search and find any item that they have. So this is really important. You don't want any items to get lost. Um, so make sure that you add tags to make it easier for everyone to find what they're looking for. And you can set up uh, separate items into groups and schedule each group to be available at different times. So as we talked about, um, we've seen this happen in two different ways. We've had the silent auction, which is one group that goes on for two hours. And then when the live portion of the auction goes in, they close down the silent auction, and then it's just the live auction for the next hour, whatever they have for that to be open. You can do it that way. You can do it between different, ex like an experience or a product based. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that your organization could uh, do this uh, in QGIV, but those are some of the best practices that we have. So additional things that I wanna show you today is we have been working on a lot here uh, at QGIV and I'm really excited to share off some of these updates that we've made. Um, so the first thing that we have here is, that I wanted to show you are the updates that we've made to our peer-to-peer -peer registration. So we made this earlier in the year, and what we did to set out was not only to make it a more modern-looking registration, but to make it as fast and as simple as possible. So the first one that I'm going to show you here, it is a little bit more cumbersome, right? Because there's a lot of different options for people to choose. Um, and this is for one of our fun runs. So this is a 5K we have a way for people to participate both in person and virtual. And if I click on in person, I can then choose whether I want to participate as an individual. So I only want to fundraise for myself, or we can actually have them choose a team. And from here, they can sign up for any, any teams that are already active, or they can start a new team. So something that's really cool uh, to get your participants signed up and working either by themselves or joining a team. Then they just go in here, they fill out some of their, their information to get the registration process going. But one of the things that I really, really like here is the add additional participant. Um, I guess I have to sign, I have to fill out all of that. But the additional participant is the ability for, I mean, your, your donors that have kids, they can sign up themselves, they can sign up their husband or wife, and they can sign up any of their kids that are going to participate, or if you have development directors or event coordinators that are going to help out your donors to sign up, you can do that easily through this, where it's very easy for them to get signed up and fill out their information very, very quickly. 
we also have uh, this, like this is our one of our DIY ones. And what I really wanted to show you here is the customizable options that we have here in QGive. So as you can see with the DIY, it's free. So we don't have a registration fee. So we're able to make that as a free registration. You also see we don't have any teams and we're not asking people to sign up um, as an individual or uh, uh, in person or virtually, right? So we skip right to the details page and they can choose to add an optional donation here. But if they just fill out their name and their email address, then all they have to do is, uh, I was so close. And then they can add the optional donation here. And then if they you don't have anything to uh, ask for payment information, it's done, right? It, I did that in about 30 seconds. So really love the registration process updates and they really look great. One of the other things that I wanna show you too uh, is our, uh, our auction side. So we were able to update some of our registration in the auction side to match what we have in the peer-to-peer. -peer. It is very streamlined, it is very simple, and it's very similar to the way that we have that set up. But one of the great things that you have here, since this is a ticketed event, is we have them separated into their own categories. There's a clear distinction between them, and it's very easy just to select on uh, how many people are going to be participating. And then you can see this order summary where it updates. And then as you go through the process, it's really easy just to enter your information, click continue, and then I'm gonna choose my payment method and then I'm gonna complete my registration. So we really try to make this process as easy as possible for your donors to get signed up and fundraising and participating in your events. But one of the most exciting things that I have, you can tell that I'm getting really giddy here, is our new table seating management. So these are available for our ticketed events. So for our standard events where we have a, a movie night and we want to use a seating chart to make sure that everyone knows where they're sitting, or we are at an auction event and we have our gay, gala set up, we now have... Um, a, an easy way for your organization to set up a visual seating chart in QGIVE itself. So one of the great things that you're seeing here is that it is a drag and drop visual seating chart. So you can find the layout of your event and you can just, it's so easy guys. It is so easy just to add any of the tables that you have and um, it really makes it really easy on your organization to set these up. Then you can choose how many chairs that you want and it expands it. You can add labels. You can easily delete these and drag and drop them into different, different areas to make sure that you're mimicking what you have on site. Then when you have your seating chart in an easy way, the way that you want it, when you go into our virtual terminal, it is so easy to assign someone to a seat, just like that. In a visual component, um, it makes it easy and very fast for your organization. You see that I already have someone assigned here that I can see where they're assigned, that it's not available, and then I can choose to assign this individual to another area. So this is really exciting stuff. I'm really happy with the state of a lot of our uh, great items coming out here at QGIVE, and I hope you're excited for that as well. So let's recap. With hybrid events, they, are, they have a virtual component that extends the reach of your events and encourages any of the hesitant supporters that you have to still participate in your event. Make sure to communicate clearly, send clear communications, organize a group of dedicated supporters and inspire them uh, to participate in your events. Make sure that you're showing, showing your supporters the impact and why they should participate and use fundraising tools that make it as easy as possible for you to set up and host hybrid events. And Diana, I'm gonna call you back on so that we can answer any questions. Hi, Justin, that was super exciting. Um, we'll give a couple of folks, we'll, we'll give folks a couple of seconds to get their questions in. But I'm personally excited because a lot of these things that we've seen, I haven't seen before either. Like that table setting mm -hmm. arrangements, that was so cool. I was kind yes. of geeking out about that. Um, a colleague and I were talking about a recent auction that they attended and they were telling me about how useful it was to have those notifications. 
if you're getting outbid on something. So these are yeah, all really exciting enhancements. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, when you use these tools in QGIV, what information gets pushed over to Bloomerang? Sure. So Bloomerang, we have a direct integration with, and a lot of the donor information that you have, the basic stuff that will automatically um, get uh, mapped over into Bloomerang itself so that you can, you know, pull over that donor information and it'll pull over some of their registration, the registration information, their donor donation information. Um, so the, the integration that we have with Bloomerang it's fantastic, and it provides a lot of uh, flexibility and custom and options for your organization to track um, that fundraising campaign. We also have the ability to track that event specifically and the different, uh, I think it's campaigns and funds that you guys have in there um, to, you can map those over very easily and track your fundraising success from QGIV and then get it into Bloomerang itself. And then if you have any custom fields as well, you can pull those over, like I was talking about with dinner options. When you do add those, you can actually create a custom mapping in the integration itself that will map that information over into Bloomerang. So you can see all that information in Bloomerang as well. Brandon, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. That pretty much covered it. I, I would just reiterate that uh, you know you kind of you can kind of think of it as um, any data that you're collecting on the QGIV platform. There is an option to map that over uh, to a respective field on the Bloomerang side. So uh, whatever you're trying to collect uh, on an event basis or on a donation basis, or even if you're using the system for something out of the box, volunteer registration or you know zero dollar registrations, all of that data can be easily synced over. Um, it does take some time to set it up up front, but our team's really uh, well versed at helping folks uh, get that built out and, and mapping those fields accordingly so that really it's a breeze from there on out. Um, I think you know, that's the number one thing that our, our mutual clients love about the, the partnership that we've established is that integration uh, because it does save tons of time. I've heard, you know, I've heard upwards of 400 hours annually um, and that's, I mean, that's just huge. What would you do with that extra time in your day uh, to, to be fundraising or setting up your next event? Um, and it does look like we've had, we have a question here. I'll stop gushing about our integration now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, I love that call out because I mean, you're there's so much there's so many moving parts to an event. That's something you at least you don't want to have to worry about and what the state integration does very well. So that's a great call out. Um, we have a question here from Amy. How long is the QGIV information available in Bloomerang? Or when should an uh, when should an event fundraiser end and the and the integration end? I, I can jump in on that one as mm -hmm. well, Cook. Um, yeah, I, I think the answer is in, indefinitely as long as you're using Bloomerang um, and you're you're you know signed up as a, a paid subscriber, right? We, we, we've got to got to make sure that's in place, but uh, the the information will be there. Um, we do have two main options for how the integration transfers that data. Um, really. One is manually, so you get to decide when it gets transferred over, but the more, I think, beneficial and the more time-saving route is to do it automatically. So what happens is, and I think we've got some great testimonials on our website about this, I'm, I'm thinking of the Joseph Maley Foundation in particular, um, you, you're transferring data that evening. So as transactions are occurring, as people are checking out, as uh, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser is concluding, um, you know, whatever whatever the the frequency, or I'm sorry, whatever the the timing of the transaction is, mm -hmm. it's moments later that that data will be over into your your. Uh, Bloomerang account. Um, so one of the one of the best things is that when you are closing out an event, you just want to go home. Uh, you know, you want to you want to get out of there. You, it's a success. You you've got it under your belt. And then next Monday morning, let's let's say it's on a weekend, it, it's right there for you. You can start cultivating those relationships. You can start doing your follow-ups because the data's already made it into Bloomerang in a usable fashion. And I, I do see um, we would do the monthly events for the auction. Um, I mean, I, I hope that answers your question. I, I think you know, regardless of how how many events you're doing uh, on a monthly or quarterly basis or annual basis, uh, that's how the integration would work. And we're happy to, to help you get that set up, Amy, if, if you're a current user or, or talk to you more about it if you, you have interest in using QGIV. Absolutely. I think that's a great segue to, I'm going to launch a poll right now. If you'd like a follow-up, um, please let us know. 
and we'll leave that up as we're answering Q and A. I think this is a great. We I see another question come in, but I think this is a great point too because the way that Q give subscription work is you can you can use it as long as you're using it. And even though you may pause your usage of QGIV, let's say you don't have an event coming up, it's not going to erase any of the data that's already in your Bloomerang database. It's The integration is never going to erase any of that data. So if you're pausing and resuming your activities within QGIV, you always already have that information. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Dan. I don't know that we we covered that as extensively as we have on others, uh, you know, other academies in the past. But uh, mm -hmm. on our website, you can see that we do have monthly and quarterly options for our, our packages. Uh, so we're not locking you into a long term commitment on the uh, on the QGIV side, uh, as you need our different tools for your auction for your peer to peer or, or a number of the things that, that Justin went over today. Um, you can you can jump in and out of our different packages uh, throughout the year. Uh, so it's not a long term commitment. Maybe you're not, you know, asking the board to commit to a multi-year contract or anything like that. It's just use it as you need it and, and really take advantage of the tools that are available to you through the QGIV offering. Yeah, I love that flexibility. Um, we have a question here from Kathy who asks, we've dealt with challenges of duplicate constituents from various events. How is that handled with, with the QGIV integration to Bloomerang? Yeah, I, I've heard great things. Sorry, uh, Justin, I'm going to jump in as well. I see you're, you're taking the time to, to clear some of that congestion. Um, yeah, we, we've we heard great uh, feedback over the years with our integration. Uh, the way that Bloomerang has it set up is that they do a lot of the deduping almost automatically. Uh, so it, it kind of just happens as our data transfers over from QGIV to Bloomerang. Uh, there are certain rules in place that allow for uh, deduping in an automated fashion. And it really, you know, while we're not going to ever catch everything, um, I think that's an unrealistic expectation for any uh, technical integration. Uh, there's always going to be stuff that does slip through the cracks where we, we can seriously mitigate uh, against the, the risk of duplicates uh, based on the rules that, that are in place on the Bloomerang side. Uh, so I know, you know, even compared to some of our other great integrations, there's less duplicates that are created on, on the Bloomerang side or through the Bloomerang integration. I hope that helps, Kathy. Happy to, to drill into that more if you need to. Yeah, and if, you, if anyone needs a refresher, so Bloomerang takes a look at first name, last name, plus either email address or phone. So if their first name and last name plus either email address or phone, is the same in Bloomerang, then it's going to um, put the transactions and interactions on, on that existing account. And if it doesn't match, um, it's going to create a separate account, which you can easily merge. Like, you know, some reasons why we might not catch a match, for example, is maybe they have their full name versus they're using their nickname or they're using one email address versus the others. But duplicate, um, Bloomerang does also have a built-in duplicate checker. So you get alerted if there are potential duplicates in your database that you can easily merge them. And you can also, all that data that's coming from QGIV, you can report on all of that information too. So if you also are taking a look at those reports and are eyeballing um, your constituents that have registered for events, you might catch some that, that the system doesn't catch um, as well. Great. Um, Justin and Brendan, we, I love the examples. I was just marveling at the creativity of some of the hybrid events that, um, that you showed us as samples today. What are some of the, what are some of your favorite hybrid events that you've attended or you've participated in? I think one of my favorite ones was we had an organization that did a peer-to-peer -peer and an auction together, which was very interesting. Um, and essentially how they did it was it was an at-home party um, and you basically collected your own little group to start fundraising. And then it is all culminated, it like all culminates in the auction event at the end. So essentially they started the peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. They started to get individuals signed up. Um, I think it was about two months early. Then you started fundraising for them. Um, you're raising money. And you were trying to win and get the leaderboard. But since it was the pandemic, basically you had your own house party when the actual event happened. So everything was, uh, was in virtual at that time. Um, but then everyone got, came over. You had, we had uh, dinner and we had some drinks and we watched the live stream. We were participating in bidding. It was a really great and fun thing, uh, fundraiser that 
that was it was really fun brendan i don't know if you have one uh, my favorite i it's, i'm gonna give a shout out to one of our great national partners uh big brothers big sisters um they have their bowl for kids sake and that obviously became hard to do or, or almost impossible to do in some areas of the country as as the pandemic uh, kind of changed our our approach um, and so they just kind of broadened it. There were a couple of, of different uh, affiliates that broadened it to do something for kids sake. And you alluded to it earlier, Justin, there were things like run up and down your stairs 30 times, um, just easy, low hanging fruit type thing, stuff that, that I don't have to really put a lot of commitment into as a constituent and something to just keep folks engaged. It may not have been a huge fundraiser for them, but you know, I, I think some of them actually did uh, exceed what some of their goals were for the, for the proper do, you know, bowl for kids sake event when they were replacing it with this, this idea of do something for kids sake. And I don't think it's limited by the type of organization you are. You all have your missions and you can apply uh, that, that logic to your missions and, and ask folks to just partake, just be a part of it and, and reach out to their their broader audience and their network and, and fundraise on behalf of the organization as well. So those are always, I think, really cool for, for me uh, because I'm, I'm just like all other consumers. I want it easy. I want it, I want it, to, I want it low commitment and I want to enjoy myself. So uh, those are, those are probably some of my favorites that I've, I've seen from a hybrid or, or um, you know, virtual, fully virtual approach. I love that. It doesn't have to be very complicated. And I'm right. sure too, like if you're, especially if you're doing peer to peer, you might get some ideas from your donors and your constituents too. Yep. You know, I mean, you might be feeling tapped out, but there's a lot of creativity out there. Oh yeah. Yeah. And like I mentioned before too, there's, I mean, game nights, trivia nights, those are some of the ones that, you know, they're really easy to put on. They're very quick, but they, they often raise a lot of money. Um, same thing with network fundraisers where you're trying to encourage some of your bigger local celebrities or your board members to actually fundraise. Those are really great to tap into additional networks to get them in, to get them out and fundraising um, and really getting your organization in front of people that you normally wouldn't. So I love Justin's call out too of combining yeah. these tools. You don't just you don't need to limit yourself to one or the other you can use all of these tools in conjunction with each other and make it that more, much more powerful and impactful. Love that. Um, we have a question here. Does QGive have user groups where ideas can be shared? Lots of great creativity shared with various examples. Not yet. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leak it. Uh, I'll leak it just to this select group. We are working towards uh, user groups. Um, don't share this outside of this. I know this is recorded, so someone's going to watch it. But uh, yes, QGIV is moving towards user groups. We understand the power um, in, in comparison to other folks that are using the similar platform. So um, it's something that we've, we've worked towards for a long time. And uh, I don't have a date yet, uh, but it's something that I, I hope will be available very soon uh, so that Kathy and, and everybody else on our platform can benefit from uh, other people's experiences and other, other great examples like we've been sharing today. I love that too. And not to give more work for anyone, <laughs> over there, but we also love, I mean, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you've done something that you think is like, hey, this is really cool. Yeah. Like, you know, I would love to share this. Please don't hesitate to reach out and, and share it with us. We would love to highlight that. We're all, that's why we do these Academy classes is to learn from each other, not just our presenters. So if there's anything that you would like to highlight, highlight, we're more than happy to celebrate that with you and share in your excitement and, and in your celebration. So, yeah. yeah. I, I would just, I would add, add to that, Diana. I mean, we, both teams, both the Bloomerang and QGIV team do a great job of, of producing content that speaks to exactly that, Kathy. Um, you know, we have a, 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 a piece that we call Bright Ideas, and it's just a blog article that teaches you a, a different, unique way that some folks are using our system, things that are more out of the box that could apply to your mission and, and your constituent base. So, um, you know, use our websites, use the resources that we make available to you all. It's it's all there for you, uh, fr free of charge. I mean, some mm -hmm. of them you have to put in your email address to download, but, you know, that's uh, that's to be expected these days. Uh, but yeah, that's that's all there for you to, to go learn as well. To expand on that too. Yeah. Expand on that too. We have client spotlights as well. So kind of like a dual approach. So the first one is a bright idea where <clears throat> we have one of 
as Brendan mentioned, we have someone uh, and we highlight a specific event that like really caught our eye. And then we also have a client spotlight that goes out and it looks at a specific client. But we also we often talk about some events that they hosted in that as well. So um, or a specific campaign or something that they did creatively. Um, so that is all there, like Brenda mentioned, on our website. Um, and you can also look for ideas in our case studies and testimonials. A lot of our clients love to share the things that they've done, um, things, uh, unique ways that they've used our specific platform. So lots of great information out there. Um, I'm curious too, because speaking about user groups and sharing information, Brendan, can you talk, talk to us about what's on your um, background there of the QGIM conference coming up? It's it's working, uh, yeah. We've got a we've got our, our first user conference. Um, we had planned to to do this uh, prior to the pandemic, and certainly COVID had a, a different different plan for us. Um, but we were able to to retain that spot October second through the fourth in in sunny Orlando, Florida. Um, I don't know how many of you all have been lucky enough to be here. I know Cook and I, Justin and I, live here in Central Florida, but it's beautiful that time of year. Uh, so we're, we'd love to have anybody who's on the line and, and really, you know, anybody uh, come join us. Uh, we've got some great sessions. I know Justin's doing so, uh, a few, a handful, I think, too. And two um, so far. <laughs> yeah, so we've got them lined up uh, both from the, the industry expertise and, and trends perspective, but also very, uh, very specifically for our users. Um, so that may be something for Kathy or, or uh, I think Thomas was also another newer user uh, coming on board or, or anyone else to join. Uh, we are welcoming uh, non-users as well who are just kind of looking to learn about the, the platform. So thank you, uh, Diana, for calling that out. I hope it wasn't too gaudy sitting here you know, over by my head, um, but I uh, appreciate that. We'd love to see you all there. We're, we're all about the learning here. So uh, we're, we're, we're all friends in the industry and we would love to share these learning resources with everyone. So please do check that out. If you're available um, and you're so inclined, um, you can scan that QR code that um, Brendan has over there and get more details. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we're coming up on time. Thank you so much, both of you for all of that great information. Any parting words for our friends today? I I do have a, a an industry stat that I've I've kind of shared uh, when it comes to to hybrid uh, approaches. You know, we all learned throughout this pandemic the ways that we need to adjust. Um, you know, and and even though some of us are are getting back to the in person, um, I I was reading a report uh, done by an industry vendor uh, that says seventy percent of respondents for this research project that they did will continue to have hybrid events moving forward. Um, and I think it speaks volumes to what Justin was trying to kind of share, uh, that it, it, it expands your audience. You know, it, it allows you to, to invite folks that maybe wouldn't otherwise be able to attend. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you're planning your events. And, you know, hopefully you can use some of the tips and tricks that we gave you today to, to help implement those and, and keep that, that reach as broad as possible. Yeah. I think you summed it up perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And again, it's all about making easier for your donors, get them to be more engaged, whatever those different avenues are. Don't be afraid to explore those different avenues. Thank you again, Justin. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you all of you for being here with us today. We hope that you picked up some cool tips and trips tricks that you maybe <laughs> want to try on your next hybrid event, or maybe you haven't tried hybrid events before and this has inspired you to try them. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out if you need anything. And we hope you have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you in another Academy class soon. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you.